So hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for this May edition of the 2022 Glaze webinar series. Uh, this is titled Collaboration with Academia and Industry, a case study of the Dutch CEA industry. So my name is Haley Rylander. I'm the Extension Support Specialist with Glaze, that's the Greenhouse Lighting and Systems Engineering Consortium. And before we get started on this webinar today, as usual, I would like to extend a huge thanks to our current Glaze industry and CEA members for their support. It's because of them that we can promote these activities and offer them to a wide range of audiences. I would also like to highlight Glaze's individual membership option, which is an affordable way for anyone to be a part of Glaze. For an annual fee, you can have access to all the recordings of our past short courses, free admission to future short courses, which we'll have another one coming up this October with more information coming soon and access to articles and online tools on the Glaze website. I know we've had some issues with, with the payment page not accepting payments, but that is completely resolved now. So rest assured that will no longer be an issue and thank you for your patience. So today's speaker is Dr. Leo Marcellus, a professor at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Dr. Marcellus grew up on a farm and studied horticulture at Wageningen University in research. Uh, since eight, 1987, he has worked for several departments at Wageningen University, and throughout the years, he has researched many aspects of growth and functioning of horticultural plants grown in greenhouses and on vertical farms. His research contributes to sustainable horticultural production while improving production and quality. This includes saving of energy, crop monitoring, computational modeling, efficient use of LED light, and efficient use of water and nutrients. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Marcellus. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thanks a lot, uh, Hey, for this nice uh, introduction. I assume you can see my screen, isn't it? Yes, looks good. Great. I'm very happy uh, that I get this uh, opportunity uh, for giving a presentation. So thanks a lot for the uh, for the invitation. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about a, a few examples of our projects and where we uh, work together with uh, with companies. Uh, sorry for that. No. Maybe just to start a little bit on uh, where I'm working. I'm working in Wageningen, the Netherlands, or in Europe. Um, I'm working at Wageningen University and Research. And in fact, that has two entities. It is the university and it is a research institute, which is called Wageningen Research. So the, the first part is the university. I'm working at the university. Just to give you a little bit of an idea what type of, or how the size of the university is. And what I need to say, this uh, university is completely focused on life sciences or agricultural science in a broad sense. So we have about 13,000 bachelor and master students. And uh, yeah, I put here a few uh, things on, on rankings. Uh, quite often, Wageningen is ranked uh, first, uh, for instance, first in the, in the agricultural uh, domain and also in the Netherlands of all the universities. We are ranked as a, yeah, on, on different type of ranking and criteria number, number one. So we're very proud of that. So we have the university and we have the research institutes where the idea is that the university is, is doing the education, they do also the research, so mainly research by PhD candidates, postdocs, where the institutes of Wageningen research do a bit more the applied research. But it is all a bit of a gradual scale going from more fundamental to more applied. And there's also partly an overlap. So within the Wageningen UR, so we have here in green the university part and the blue Wageningen research, and there are many interlinks between that. And then in our university, we have five what we call science groups. And if I say just simply, we have plant, we have social sciences, animal, environmental science, and the agrotechnology. So not surprisingly, I'm in the plant science. And within the plant science group, I'm leading a, within the university part of the plant sciences, I'm leading a, a group on horticulture and product physiology. So the size of my uh, group, well, you can see it here on the picture. Picture was, by the way, taken yesterday evening. So it's very fresh. Um, so we have um, about 10 uh, assistant and associate professors. Then we have a number of technicians. 
uh, five postdocs, 25 PhD candidates. And then with the education, our master's students in their final year, they do a, a research of half a year. And then usually on an annual basis, we have about 40 of those students who do a research in our group. So that's just so that you have a little bit of an idea where I'm working, what size it is. And then, well, what is the mission of our group? We, we are a university, so we are primarily evaluated in the end on, on the scientific quality. Um, but we do that based or we focus on greenhouse and vertical farming. So we want to provide a scientific foundation for sustainable production. And that production should also be of high quality products in greenhouse and vertical farms. So then we are dealing with topics like yield and quality improvement. Um, it is quality at harvest, but we also have uh, several staff members who focus on the post harvest quality. Energy saving is in greenhouse vertical farm is a big issue and which comes now even more uh, important with energy prices, which are, are rising or have been risen quite a lot. But it's also about water and nutrient use. And what we do is we want to explore and exploit the physiology of plants. And what I mean with that, with exploring is really referring to the science that you want to do very good science. We want to understand the plants. But in fact, we want to do a bit more of that. We also want to exploit, and that refers to that we want to do research what is relevant for the industry. So what we try to do is that we come up with a lot of publications in, 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 in good journals. You see here a few examples of a paper in plants and plant sciences or in nature food. But at the same time, we also talk with the companies. Also for myself, for instance, today in the morning, I had some meetings uh, with uh, other universities. And in this afternoon, I was in a meeting uh, with a few rose growers discussing about uh, lighting uh, to be well, what, what, light, what choices to be made with respect to lighting. And that's what I personally like very much, that they can do good science, but also discuss about the applications and how growers can use that. If you look at our the funding situation uh, for us as a university, then, um, well, we, for our education, we, get, we, we are being paid by, depending on, on student numbers. But for our research part, we are depending on, 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 on other funds. Uh, we don't get, in fact, much money from the university. No, we have to get it all on a project basis. And then we have subsidy agencies. Uh, an important one for us in the Netherlands is the Dutch Research Council. It can also be the European Commission. We have a subsidy agency to what's called top sector horticulture. And that is in the Netherlands, we have 10 top sectors or so the government has decided okay these are our key sectors in the country which are of high economic importance and among those 10 horticulture is one of them and that also helps that there is more budget available for research with all those funding agencies uh, what i wrote here is zero to 50 percent funding by private companies i must say most of the projects that i have in my group are where there is some funding of private companies. So mo many of those funding agencies say, well, we, you, can, uh, you, you, you can submit a proposal for a research, but to be funded, you need to show that, you, that, that it is relevant for companies and that relevance preferably should also be uh, proven that the company pays part of the research. Um, and yeah, it, it depends on a bit on the type of call that you have, whether it's, whether it's well, uh, just a few percent, let's say 5% or 50%. I would say in our group, many of our research projects have 10 or 30% funding from private companies. Um, so as I said, the subsidy agencies put that as, as a criteria also to see that it is relevant for companies. And then that what the companies contribute can be depending on the subsidy agency that it needs to be uh, a contribution with cash uh, money. In, in a number of cases, they prefer in fact that it is an in-kind contribution. In-kind meaning, okay, that also the company does do part of the research or that they deliver specific equipment. And that's in fact, if often considered even more um, 
uh, to show that what we do is relevant for the companies. They really have to do then things, have to work together. So it's also a bit of a guarantee that, or well, we are forced then to get that funding to work together. And I would say, well, that also works very well. I would say the majority of our research is uh, funded by funding agency with where it is a combination of subsidy and uh, private money. Besides that, we also do a lot of research for directly for private companies where the research is completely funded by the companies. Um, yeah, and what type of companies? I did not uh, put here the list with all the companies that we are working on because I thought, well, then I uh, probably may miss a, a, a few. But what we do a lot with uh, working with lighting companies, oh, yeah, I see that for the lighting companies, I mentioned uh, a, a few of them where we do have a lot of, re well, quite elaborate research programs. But it is also with um, uh, companies focusing on climate control computers companies constructing vertical farms, greenhouses, on companies with routing substrates, and well, there are many more uh, with whom we cooperate. And as I said, I also really find it fun to work together with companies. And also for me, and that's maybe also because I grew up on a farm, I appreciate very much that what we do is relevant for the industry. But we have also a few key values if we cooperate. We are a university, so we want always to stay independent. Uh, otherwise, we, so we can work with a company and in one project, we, 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 we may say, okay, we work with that company, keep that, do not work together with a competitor and keep it separate what we do with this company from another competitor. But it might be that we do also another research project with a competitor. Although, and, and that is because we want to, to always to remain independent of one specific company uh, also yeah we are a university so we what we do should be objective such that the results that we present that that the, uh, yeah that, that it can be uh, yeah that, that, that you can believe that it is that it is true and not based on a commercial interest and that's in the end well the scientific quality is very important for us and because as a university, in the end, we are mainly evaluated on scientific quality, scientific publications. So for us, it's also important that you do research which can be published. Well, then often working together with companies, there is something like, well, well how to deal with confidentiality. So before we start a research, we make agreements on, on what level of confidentiality it is and about when can the results be published and usually it means that there is some delay in the publications so it may mean that often i cannot tell about what i'm doing today but what i can do is that i can tell about that research what has been published we have uh, we work a lot together of course with companies in the netherlands there's a big industry in the whole uh, greenhouses vertical farms uh, but we see also that uh, there is a lot of interest from the whole from over the world, uh, I've indicated here a few uh, rot, uh, sorry, few uh, red, uh, well, what is it, stars, uh, indicating where we are, where we have projects together with um, uh, with companies in other countries. Um, we work together with a lot of universities in the Netherlands or in Europe that I didn't, did not indicate, but here I indicated the, those universities outside Europe where we have at, at present uh, cooperation uh, with, and that is. Well, we as a university also consider ourselves um, as an international university. So our students, the master in, in the bachelor program, still they're all Dutch, but then the master program, it's an international program in plant sciences. I think about 60% of our students are from abroad. And then, yeah, abroad really means the whole, uh, the whole world. And the same holds also for our PhD candidates. Um, I guess uh, in my group, about 75% uh, is uh, non-Dutch. And then the number of countries is quite a lot. What I would like to do now is, uh, and I was asked um, to give a presentation on how we collaborate with companies. I was not sure, yeah, what to, what to show exactly. How do I show that which and which projects would I show? Um, 
so I had to make I, I had to make a choice. So I I chose I made a selection of a few just to indicate what type of research we're doing, and also that you can see that it is working together with larger consortia of companies. But I must say we also have much smaller projects on where we work together just with one one company. Um, this is uh, the, the program which is called Let It Be 50%. And Let It Be 50% was uh, the idea on saving 50% by the smart use of LED lighting. This is a research program which is now about to uh, finish. Um, this was a cooperation of five Dutch universities and in total there were three postdocs and eight PhDs um, uh, working on this. And typically a PhD in analysis, four year and a postdoc project is typically three or four years. And here we had 10 different private uh, partners. And those partners also had to contribute to the, res to, to the cost of the research and together they funded 30% of all the costs and then the 70 re remaining 70 percent remaining came from the Dutch Research Council. So the target of this uh, program was an overall saving of energy in greenhouses by 50 percent by the smart use of LEDs. When we defined this project, and that's already a number of years ago, uh, we said, well, how can we save 50 percent? energy in a greenhouse, well, then we can do that by 60% saving on the electricity for the lamps. And, but there is not, so you would say, hey, that's already more than 50%. Um, but you have to realize there's not only energy needed for the electricity of the lamps, of course, also for heating. And then we split up that 60% in 30% efficiency of the lamp or efficiency of the impact, efficacy should you ride on a lamp and 30% improvement of the efficiency of the light used by the plants. Here, as a reference, we took a greenhouse where a high pressure sodium lamps was used. And now you can see already that, that this program, when it was defined in 2015, the LEDs were not yet 30% more efficient in converting electricity into light. Now already they are uh, much more efficient. Um, I, I would say they are, uh, they're using about half the uh, electricity compared to an HPS. But where our research is focusing on is on this 30%, how to make more efficient use of the lamps by using LEDs in a smart way. And I'm very, I think we have shown a number of results on how to improve this light use efficiency. And if we improve the light use efficiency, it means that with the same amount of energy, we can produce more. Well, that's good for reducing the costs, and in, in particular in those days when energy prices are so high. But also from a sustainability point of view, this is very important. And I would say with this, third, with, with this improvement, that is one step in the end we need to do this. This is a surge that needs to continue in a very rapid way in the coming uh, years, not only to be economically viable, but also for acceptance by society of these production systems. How did you think that 30% higher light use efficiency uh, is possible? Well, we think that it is possible by a better light absorption. Because we can have lamps, but then it is important that also the light is absorbed by the leaves. For instance, if the leaf reflects light and that is reflected to the, sea, to, to, the, to the greenhouse cover, in fact, it is lost. It's not used for, for the plant or when it falls on the floor or wherever it can fall. I think there are opportunities to improve it, but this is not just about improving the total absorption, but also how the light absorption is distributed over the different leaves. In general, if the light is more uniformly distributed, you may expect an increase in photosynthesis and consequently in growth and yield of the plant. It's about, can we get a higher rate of photosynthesis per unit leaf area? And last but not least, the assimilate partitioning. And here we work with tomato, and then it is about, how is the fraction of assimilates partitioned between fruits and vegetative parts? And we'll give you a few examples of the research. 
This is a study which we did do in, in, in fact already a little bit earlier, but to show what we think that light, the distribution of light could do. I have to say this is just theoretical calculation. This was with a simulation model. Uh, in a simulation model, you can easily compare a canopy with an open architecture or a more compact structure. We estimated that with a more open architecture, you can get on a crop level about 10% more photosynthesis. And this is mainly related to this more uniform distribution of light over the leaves. Well, how can this be realized? This could be realized by breeding. You can also think about using the spectrum of the light to create a specific structure of a plant. But then we also have to balance on this open structure, which might be good for the overall growth of the plant. What is this um, practically uh, uh, good news or not? Because if you have a more a taller crop, well, does it still fit in the greenhouse, for instance? So, or if it would be an ornamental, well, then very much depend what type of ornamental, whether you want to have it compact or not. So there are many more consequences of having a compact or a tall plant. Another item that I would like to know is uh, interlighting. Solar light all comes from above. High pressure sodium lamps you typically have on top of the plants. What it does mean is that the top leaves get a lot of light. Maybe they are almost saturated with light. And then still at the bottom of the plant, they are more or less in the dark, very light limited. So what can we do with interlight, intercanopy light, in lighting in between the canopy? Well, what are the benefits? Is that there is less loss due to reflection of the roof. If light falls on top of a canopy, about five to seven percent of that light is being reflected. That is lost. With intercanopy lighting, depending on how it is positioned, uh, um, we can reduce the amount of light which goes to the roof. It's also important a more uniform distribution in the vertical plane. But I have to say, it is not only positive effects, we can also think about a few points that are maybe not so good of the intercanopy lighting. And that is about how is then the horizontal distribution of the light? Because if we have here uh, uh, an LED module in between the canopy and there is a leaf here, this gets a lot of light. But then the leaf just next to it will be more, will be very dark. So non-uniform distribution in the horizontal plane. So within the Sky High program, we did do a lot of some work on intracanopy lighting. Subsequently, we also work together with some other lighting companies on intercanopy lighting. Uh, and I think now more we get more and more evidence that with intercanopy lighting, we can definitely make much more efficient use of the light than with only top lighting. But then, as I said, this is for high wire crops like a tomato crop. If you're talking about a small plants, then there is not much to do about interlighting. So this interlighting is only relevant for, for high, for tall type of plants. This architecture of plants is a very important one. And that's also where far red can come into play. So what we see here is very young tomato plants, which were grown under 150 micromole of red, blue LEDs. And then there were some far red added going from left to right, a higher intensity of far right, and you immediately see with far right, you get more elongation, higher leaf area, therefore more light interception. And that was a reason for much more rapid growth. To some extent, you can also get those effects by end of day lighting. In fact, that's lighting at the beginning of the night. Just a little bit of far right at the beginning of the night often also leads to much more elongation. And here you have then to compare the plant at the completely right hand side, which got 15 micromoles during about 15 minutes uh, at the start of the night, compare that to the one which is completely at the left. Again, what we usually see in young plants, we see a strong increase in growth of the plants. We see also a very different morphology. So again, here the question is, what type of morphology would a grower like to have? If it is an Again, if it is an ornamental, many ornamental plants need to be compact. So then you should not use this. Or maybe you can use it in a very young plant stage, but not in the later plant stage. This is the same experiment with tomato, but then just a little bit later. 
the thing I should now move on a little bit more to stay within time. Another example here, there's a lot of text on the slide, but maybe just forget what you see on text. Just look at the picture. This is an example of what we can do with blue light. On the left-hand side, where it says 0% blue, uh, apologies, it's a bit, little bit misleading because on the left-hand side, it is white light mimicking the solar spectrum. Well, in the solar spectrum, there is already a quite a bit of blue, about 25%. But where it says here 0% blue, it means it is 100% white. On the right-hand side, where you see 50% blue, it means 50% of the white light is being replaced by blue. And then you see a typical response. If you add more blue, you get more compact plants. But if you look also at the total biomass of the plant, yeah, it is less. So this is a typical example with blue light. You get more compact plants, but it may lead to less light interception and therefore less growth. There is clearly an optimum because you would need some, always some blue in the light. If it increases, usually you get more compact plants. And then the very uh, uh, strange phenomena occurs that if you would go to 100% or maybe 90% of blue light, then all of a sudden you might get again a very elongated plant. Well, I think it goes now a bit too far to explain how that, uh, how that works. But this is, I would say, the interesting world of uh, what you can find with working with different spectra. As I said in this program, it was 15%. We think that we can improve the, by the smart use of LEDs, the, the, the growth by about 15% to a better light absorption over the canopy. We think that also on uh, a leaf level, uh, sorry, on photosynthesis, we can have some increases by choosing the right uh, spectrum. Many questions that we get often with that, well, is green light effective? Well, what we usually see is, yes, green light absolutely does do also photosynthesis. Usually it is a little bit less efficient than, uh, than red light. That's what we can see here in particular if we look at the green, sorry, at the blue line. But that's for a single leaf. In the end, no grower is growing a single leaf. They are growing a crop which consists of many leaves. Then already the differences get smaller between green light and red light. And there are even a number of publications who claim that green light could be even better, in particular at very high intensities where, because the green light penetrates deeper in the canopy. Another point of where there's at the moment a lot of research is on the far red light, which is typically considered as non-photosynthetic active. Uh, radiation, but we have we know now also that well the far red also contributes to photosynthesis, and then we can debate on how efficient is it? Is it equally efficient, or to what extent is it is it efficient? But this improvement of photosynthesis also depends on when do we turn the lamps on? Can we have a continuous monitoring of uh, uh, the rate of photosynthesis, and based on that, turning off or on the lamps? And the last item in this research program was about assimilate partitioning. Uh, this is an interesting result about FARAD. Um, that what we have, and we have seen it now in many, pub, many experiments. I just see now that they indicated that it's unpublished. But by the way, in the meantime, it has been published in several publications so now because that um, with FARAD, you get relatively more fruits. So, what FARAD does do, it does balance the ratio between vegetative and generative growth. Well, then what we did, we, we studied this in detail. We studied also uh, what is the explanation. The explanation is mainly on the sink strength of the fruit, uh, leading that to a scientific publication. But where the question was here, well, how do you cooperate? Well, then this is a very sci uh, interesting scientific question. At the same time, this is extremely relevant for growers. A tomato growers continuously wants to balance between vegetative growth and generative growth. Well, this far red light, I would say, that gives now an extra button or an extra tool to the grower to steer the plant towards vegetative or generative growth. It also means it should not have continuously the far red on. No, it should be based on what balance you want. And then here we see, um, yeah, there are a lot of signals. So, so only look on the y-axis and the x-axis. On the y-axis, we see the fruit dry weight. On the x-axis, the far red intensity. Um, so this was additional 
to the power light. And what we see here clearly is with increasing the far right intensity, we got a clear increase in the fruit dry weight and the similar results we have been seen on a fruit fresh weight. And of course, well, what I did not show here or do not show here is the quality, but in general, we see that the quality, if there is an effect of the far right, then uh, it is a positive one because usually we see a bit higher sugar content. So this guy, uh, so then, so far, it was the Let It Be program, a large research program. Another one, uh, which is a large program and which is now running, which is still in, 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 in relatively early stages, is the Sky High program. Uh, Sky High focuses on vertical farming. Uh, it is mainly funded by the Dutch uh, Research Council, so NWO. Um, NWO funds 70% of the research cost. The companies together fund 30%. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary program. Six Dutch universities and 14 companies together um, are conducting this. And the granting is here again. It is based, well, when we were evaluated, it was based on, well, what is the excellence with respect to science and what is the excellence with respect to utilization? And this immediately, then you can understand why we have often this cooperation. It starts already from the basis on what makes if a project is granted. Well, it is not granted if it, if it is very, very excellent in science, but there is no impact in the industry, then we would have not been granted, nor the other way around. Uh, so it needs to be on both sides. This is a research program of five years. There are now at this moment uh, 17 P, the total of PhDs and postdocs is 17 uh, people. As I mentioned, it's 30% uh, of the contribution comes from companies, which is partly an in-kind contribution and partly a cash contribution. Well, where does this program focus on? On vertical farming, we defined what are the bottlenecks. And maybe it's also interesting to know, well, how did we define those bottlenecks? And that came before we started this program. Um, we contacted companies said, well, are you interested in research on this? What do you think is important? And then we had also a, a number of meetings with all the companies together. So we had a number of sessions in defining what is important to do. And there came in fact two major items uh, were considered important for many of the companies. And that is the use of energy, which is high in the vertical farm. And that's in fact, in particular, the electricity for the light. And another thing what was considered as a thing that needs to be improved are the costs. Costs are relatively high. So can we reduce that? So based on this definition together with the companies, then we subsequently also prioritized, well, what type of actions do we need to take? What are the questions that you think need to be solved? Well, the action is in particular, less energy use, because if we reduce the energy use, and, uh, then it also means less cost because quite a large fraction of all the costs are related to energy. Um, and probably we can also, if we, um, let's, yeah, that, that's in fact the next step that we said, well, then we need to improve the light use efficiency so that we can, with the same amount of light, grow more or with less light, grow the same amount. If we can use less light, we use less energy. We also maybe need less lamps, so we also need a lower investment. And what is important by if, if less light is being used in most of those vertical farming, there we also need cooling. And the cooling becomes is because there is too much energy in the system because of the lighting. So if we can grow the plants with less light energy, we need less uh, cooling again. So again, this leads to uh, less use of energy. This is a lot about how does the plant make use of the light? And there I would say we know a lot already, but we also know that there's still a lot to gain. But besides, let's say, how the plant deals with the light, it's also about how to control the climate, how to do it in an efficient way, how to make it uniform within the vertical farm. And the last option might be that we integrate it in an urban system. In this way, we think we can reduce the energy a lot, we can reduce the cost, but we do not think that in the short term that the cost will be very low. Then the question is, is it then still economically viable? Well, 
if you have a better product, then it can still be very economically viable. So we need to ensure that we create a product with a higher added value. And that can come from not, well, a few things of vertical farming that it is a guaranteed production that you can be sure on that day we produce so many kilograms, but also of a defined quality and of a quality which is better. And then quality is about how it looks like, how it tastes, um, what the nutritional value is, what the shelf life is. So here I have listed um, all the uh, uh, objectives of the sky high, but maybe I should uh, only do it very briefly because these are uh, in, in fact also a number of general objectives of vertical farming of no pesticide use, very little nutrient use, very little water use, very little land use, um, but as I said, still, there is a high energy use and for the time being, as a first step, we at least want to be uh, equal to greenhouse production with respect to the use of energy per unit product. And yeah, there are a lot of challenges. It is relatively new. There are still many questions and that makes also very uh, like uh, very logic that we have a research program also with a lot of companies together. In this program, we work together with, uh, sorry, we work with four different uh, crops uh, as example. Uh, so we work with a herb, that's basil, you could say a leafy vegetable, lettuce, a fruit vegetable, strawberry, tuber vegetable, potato. So we have a wide range of crops. And I think that's also important in the end. Well, there is a balance. For the scientific, for, for science, it would be easier to work just with one crop, then you can dive deeper. On the other hand, we also see that diff, not all the crops respond in the same way, and not even all the cultivars of a species respond in the same way. So that makes it also important to work with different crops, different cultivars. Well, and then the setup of this whole uh, research program, and I wonder want to do it here very briefly, is that we divided this where we worked with, um, as I said, in total 17 people are working on it, a large program. Yeah, then you have to make some structure in it. So we, we, we grouped them in A, B, C, D, where A is mainly working on growth and development of the plant. The B that's focusing on the quality. In the C group, that's all the research uh, on climate and energy. And D is on the integration. But I would say is that we have here a lot of interactions between all the different uh, people working and on the different, uh, sorry, and between the different universities and the companies. So, well, how do we cooperate? Well, the companies they contribute by uh, by paying some money for the research. But what I think most important is that they contribute in kind. So with each of the companies, we have made arrangements. What can you contribute? Can you contribute maybe by providing some equipment or what type of experiments can we do on your facilities or can you do on your facilities together with our researchers? Or do you have specific data sets that we can use together to analyze? And as I said, yeah, that, that depends a bit on what type of company, what type of in-kind contribution they do. But by that, um, yeah, you create automatically a lot of interaction between the universe, between the researcher of the university and the company. Um, well, and of course, then there are a lot of project meeting. Um, the whole research is grouped in nine projects and they have at least every six months, each project individually with the companies involved a meeting but some projects have it in some periods every six weeks every six weeks a meeting so that is every time discussed between the involved companies and the university and then we have as an overall program we have two meetings a year where we meet for a whole day and then luckily uh, well, for instance next week we have one of those meetings and we're all day together with all the companies and the universities uh, together Um, yeah, and what type of companies are working here so that the vertical farmers are, are in this uh, project, uh, they can directly reply, uh, use it. We have a company working on a substrate who can use it for developing new routing media, a lighting company who can use it for advising the growers for what lighting to use, and they can also use it in their directions on what LEDs to, to develop. There are also breeders in this uh, program, so they get information on where to focus on 
in the breeding, what type of, of genetic information comes up. Uh, we have a, a company, a food company, how can they use the products uh, grown in a vertical farm. There are a lot of technology companies, design, companies that design vertical farms that is, that, and, and, and control algorithms. There's even an architect in this uh, program and uh, the metropole of Amsterdam. So they can see how can we implement it in an urban area. Now I'm looking a little bit at time. I think I still have uh, eight minutes or something like that. So this is an example of a project that we did do together with one of the lighting companies, in this case, uh, Signify, um, where we studied how can we control the quality of the product by lighting? What we did do here, grew lettuce in the last six days before harvest at different light intensity, 500 micromole, 240 and 50 micromole. Well, then you can see you get a very different type of plant, not surprisingly. And interestingly is then, what does it look like after, after harvest? And I hope you can see it here on the picture that on the left-hand side, those plants that were grown at a high light intensity after two weeks or three weeks, well, they always look better than those which were grown at a low light intensity. And then to look a little bit, well, how is this explained? And that's what we can see here, because this is exactly the same experiment, the same data, but then we also measure the vitamin C concentration and the carbohydrate. And this vitamin C concentration and carbohydrate concentration, they correlate with the shelf life. So what happens with more light, the vitamin C concentration increased in the lettuce, the carbohydrate concentration increased, and these are the likely factors explaining the increase in shelf life. Well, and then of course we can think about, hey, vitamin C concentration is increased. That's also interesting uh, for the people eating the lettuce. And this effect of, of light on vitamin C concentration, we also have seen it in, in some other crops. Another example of far red with, um, this is in lettuce. And this is then a research that we did do with another company, in this case, Priva, who sponsored one of our PSD candidates. Um, well, not surprisingly, on the left, plant grown in indoor farm under red, blue LEDs. On the right hand side, when we add far red, you get a much bigger plant. But then the most relevant question is, is it then more efficient, this far red, than the visible light? Well, we see here that we grew them at different planting densities. There are two bars in it, the, the, bar, the white bars, that is when there was no far red, and the bars which are red colored, that is where there was uh, far red in the spectrum. And then what you see on the y-axis is the radiation use efficiency, so that's the growth, or the dry weight, final dry weight divided by the radiation, by the total photon flux uh, received by the plants. And then you can see that on, even on a base of all the photons that with far red, uh, it's more efficient in lettuce. This is an example of how we often analyze the growth, but I think that I'm running out of time, so I should not show this. And there's also more that you can see, okay, we work together with different type of companies. And also in those projects, we have regular meetings with the companies on what is relevant for them, where, uh, and where does the science meet with the application uh, by, by the industry. And the last topic that I want to mention is where we know more and more working on is on monitoring of plants, use of big data, artificial intelligence on how can we make an autonomous control of the whole production system. So then I would like um, to, to come to a conclusion. Um, I, I've, I've tried to give a bit of a mix of a few research results from projects where we work together with uh, companies. And by this cooperation, well, for us, it is important because in this way, uh, we can enlarge our research portfolio. And that's, I think, important to advance the science. And in this way, by doing that, we can make a more impact in the sector, in the industry. Apologies for the typo. And I would say it's also fun to collaborate. It's much nicer to work together with people than rather just do all the work on your, on your own. And combining science and industry is for me a very nice thing. And then I would like to thank you for your attention. And if there are questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Great, thank you so much.
So we do have some questions. I'm just going to get straight into that. So the first question is, how does far red light affect taste and nutrient content of plants? Okay, yeah, I think that's a very relevant uh, question. It also may depend a bit on what crop we are looking. So we did do in particular a lot with um, tomato fruits. So you, what we often see is that the sugar content, also the bricks goes up a little bit. Uh, I don't think it is that much that you can really taste it. So there was, so there was, no, if you do really with a taste, there was not that much effect. So I think there was only marginal effects. Although, yeah, analytically we see that the Briggs value goes up a little bit. Um, I think the question was uh, taste and nutritional value. Um, well, nutritional value is always well what. What, what is exactly nutritional value because it's a very broad thing and we did not study all the metabolites but in general i would say the far red has not that big effects on it and we believe that if there are effects then usually it is positive effects on on those items okay um would green light be best for intercanopy lighting Mm, I would, um, well, to be honest, I haven't studied green light for interlighting. I, I think just green light, then do you have to deal with so, several problems. Uh, first is that uh, green LEDs as such are usually not so efficient. So then probably you better use white LEDs to get the green from the white LEDs. Um, I don't, personally, I don't think that we need so much of green. So maybe in some cases we need a little bit of green. Some cases I don't see any need for green. We did do a number of experiments and then we just did hardly see any effects whether the green was, well, let's say keeping the total photons, if they were the same, it did not matter so much whether or not there was a zero or 10% or 20% green. I do know some people in literature, there's a lot of contrasting research on think on on the green. I think the most important for green is uh, the effect on the human working in it. If there was a little bit of green making, let's say if you would have otherwise only red blue, if you add some green, it's getting more light, uh, sorry, more white. So I think it's more important for the human than that it is for the plant. Now the next question is more of a comment. So just saying that far red in combination with regular red has long been known to increase. Uh, PS deficiency over individual application and is known as the Emerson effect. Um, so I think that was around the same uh, intercrop lighting section of the talk. Uh, sorry, red. that was very rapid. I'm not sure if I if I, if I got not the question. Oh, sorry. sorry, here I can say it again. So far red in combination with red light has long been known to increase PS efficiency over individual application. This is known as the Emerson effect. Yes, that is that is correct. Cool. Okay, the next question is what was the yield of lettuce by watt? And this was uh, toward the end of the presentation, just before the artificial intelligence. Okay. So what was the efficiency? So I'm not sure what the exact efficiency in then. Uh... What was the yield of lettuce by watt? What do you mean with the, the what the energy watts you mean or mm -hmm. yes by unit of energy okay um so what we had here in this example it went up to radiation use efficiency let's say what is the maximum here 0.4 gram per mole um and then it depends on the spectrum well this was a red blue spectrum and uh, far red now I have to, then it very much depends on what LEDs we are using. So first I have to convert it from um, moles to, yeah, sorry, I have to, to, to make now the calculation. If I just do a simple calculation to have easy figures, I would say five uh, moles per, uh, per joule. So that would, let's say that would be one, um, uh, um, so it would be 0.1 gram per joule. And then it depends on what LEDs we are using. What is the efficacy? 
well, then uh, if you have a very modern type of LED, maybe you can reach three mole per joule electricity. Maybe some even claim that you can go to three and a half. Um, okay, and in, in that case, you can do it. we can do the math. So, sorry, <laughs> sorry for that. I think I feel that I better write down before I uh, <laughs> before I do this this calculation by heart. Sorry for that. Oh, okay. But I, I, I but I think it's more important because this result what we show here. Uh, I would say does not depend on the efficacy of the lamps, but in, when you want to calculate it in the wattage, and which is in the end, of course, for the grower most important, well, then, then you need to have this calculation backwards from moles of light to energy of light and from energy of light to energy of electricity. Great. Uh, okay. Let's kind of get back to the, the subject of academia and industry here. So uh, what advice would you give to companies that are looking to find academic collaborators? For example, does it help to have a scientific research idea and budget in mind or better to first start with a big idea and start conversing and seeing if a research program can be put together? What I think always is important is that, that there is talking between um, researchers and the companies and yes it helps also if the well it the, the mindset of the company also of course makes makes a difference um but let's say if the company is interested in 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 in, in improving um their system if they are interested in innovation i think the most important is to discuss it with researchers and i think it's also the other way around what i often see it does not work by just also for me as a researcher, if you just say, well, this is what needs to be st studied or when a grow with or a company would say that I think what is important is communication, discussing together, and then together you can come to, uh, to a good research question. And I think in the end, we need to have good research questions only if there is a good research question that makes uh, uh, it's relevant to, to look further. And then if you have a good research question, we have to see, well, can it be studied? Because maybe sometimes you have a very interesting question, which, which is very difficult to study or which is very expensive to study. But I would never start with, well, what is the budget yet? Well, it is good to realize um, uh, good research is not, is not cheap. Um, it, it costs a lot of time, so there will be a lot of labor involved. There need to be facilities involved. Um, so yes, it costs money, but in the end, I think it's more important what does it what does it give what does it bring and then you can decide on whether it's worth the investment looks like erico has a comment yes great presentation dr marcellus thanks for that uh, just a, a quick comment on what you just said it's expensive but if you think about the infrastructure that you have and, and universities have as well uh, that's that's much more expensive right just the greenhouses the people the technician the knowledge so it's it's definitely a good bang for the buck. I have a question for you. Going back to this to this uh, topic of academia and industry, uh, thanks for sharing those results. Which some of those experiments, most of them you show were sponsored by private companies. So my question to you is, especially with the title of this presentation, the, the collaboration of academics and industry in the Netherlands. We think it's a model for the rest of the world. How how easy or hard it is for these companies to then share because they're paying the top dollars, they're getting those results. Are they normally protective and they don't wanna share these results versus they're very open and they do wanna share these results? How, how you and your team and the Dutch growers and, and, and companies go around that? Yeah, we all, before we start the research, we, we discuss this very elaborately with the companies. What do, how are they there? Um, so, and then we have our value as a university on, on openness, etc., et and independence. The companies want to protect and they want, if there is patent, then they want to have rights on that. Uh, so we discuss that in, in length, what, what is important for them. Um, and then it is discussed, well, can this be published? Need, does there need to be a delay? Um, but you also have to realize, even with a scientific publication, when doing the research, when we do the research with a company together, it means it is the research that is what is relevant for that company. And besides what, what ends up in the publication, there are many more details which 
wow, which which you probably can never uh, uh, write down in a publication. That is the information that the company get. But as I said, yeah, we discuss with them on what can can we publish it, when can it be published, what rights do the company have uh, with IP. Um, so yes, companies are open, but of course, companies also want to have some competitive advantage over their uh, competitors. Um, as I said, it's always a discussion on 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 bringing together, let's say the the the. Um, yeah, the, the wishes of the company and the, and 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 yeah, what what the university uh, stands for. Um, so usually this is then also yeah a bit pre-competitive research, and often it's also that there will be then maybe a next step for some further application by the by the company themselves. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I had so many more questions, but we, we had more questions coming over, getting close to the time. Katie, if you want to take one more question from the audience, and. Sure. And why well, Haley looks um, a good one. I, uh, well, just so you know, we have a, a, I was looking through the audience here today. We had a high number of researchers and companies here. So that's why I asked this question. It's, it was a very interesting mix of public today during this presentation. All right, for our final question, let's uh, ask what methods do you find most effective to get research to growers? So things like websites, fact sheets, books, presentations, direct consultations, just um, how do you find it most effective to translate that? Oh, I think, and, 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 and maybe that sounds like a boring answer, but I really think, feel that uh, you need all the different things uh, to get it with the growers. For some growers very well may work a book, or, but I think in most cases not. Uh, or a presentation for some works very good a presentation uh, but, but quite often it needs to be a presentation that also can read down uh, read uh, what it was about um, yeah and then this direct cooperation where you do the research where the growers are involved where they can sometimes see weekly the visit and experiment uh, i did not i now realize that i did not mention that sometimes we have weekly or bi-weekly visits of experiments well those people have, are really involved in, 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 in the research. They see all, all the details. They can directly apply it. It is it far, So I would say that's the best way. But that's, that is not the way that you can reach a large number of companies. So then for a larger number of companies, it is about uh, publications in, in yeah, then it's mainly in grower journals or um, uh, yeah, the, the, the website, the the presentations, and I really think it should. It is not just one, but you need to do diff, uh, present the results uh, or disseminate the results in different in different ways. Yeah, for sure, not a boring answer at all. I think that's absolutely correct. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today for that great presentation, and thank you for everyone participating for the questions. And I uh, hope everyone has a great afternoon or evening for those in the Netherlands. Thank you.